Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. Matt, you're a very polite man, but do you F and or Jeff? I tend to F, but I tell you now, if the situation requires it, I will Jeff all night. Well, the situation did require it in this episode. So if you're not into effing and Jeffing, look away now. Twenty first of May, nineteen seventy nine, West London. In the bed of his budget hotel, Norman anxiously watches the clock on the wall. It's past midnight, and he's been trying to sleep for hours but he can't quieten the thoughts racing around his head. Tomorrow morning, he has to stand up in court and testify that Jeremy Thorpe tried to have him killed. Not only that, but it will be the first time they've been in a room together for over 15 years. The world's media will be watching. Norman's face has been plastered on front pages for the last two weeks, and the stories haven't been kind. He's been described as weak and a fantasist, He needs a distraction. 20 minutes later, he walks into a nightclub in Soho. He's mesmerised by the bright, colourful lights, the pulsating music. He orders a neat vodka, knocks it back, then heads for the dance floor. Donna Summer's I Feel Love pounds from the speakers. Norman throws his arms in the air, abandoning himself to the beat all the tension of the last few weeks leaving him. For these few precious moments, he's free. When the song ends, Norman opens his eyes to find he's surrounded by clubbers. They're all staring at him. Remembering the press coverage, he instinctively retreats, anxiously glances at the door. But then... That's Norman Scott! An excited buzz travels through the crowd. People start pointing at him. Then, they're applauding. For the first time, he feels confident. Invincible, even. Maybe, just maybe, he'll be believed. It's 5am when Norman finally steps out into the crisp morning air. The sun is rising, making this shabby part of London strangely beautiful. Norman catches sight of his reflection in a shop window. He's alarmed by his dishevelled appearance. He may fit in in the clubs of Soho, but it's the old Bailey's judge and jury that he must win over in a few hours. He quickly pushes any doubts away. Last night proved that the support he was so sure he lacked was there all along. Today, he finally has the chance to tell the truth about Jeremy Thorpe. And everyone, establishment included, will be forced to listen. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, last episode we saw Thorpe put his plan to murder Norman in place. There were many, many shocking details, but were there any that particularly stood out for you? Well, the chilling casualness with which Thorpe said that killing Norman was no worse than shooting a dog just showed his appalling attitude to other people and, for me, begged the question about whether he would ever order the murder of someone else. And the moment that he gets a party donor to effectively pay his legal bills just blew my mind. It's unbelievable that some way, somehow, he's still got this charm and charisma that allows him to bring these establishment figures in as a kind of protective shield. His privilege, time and time again, is what saves him at the last minute. Yes, and that's nowhere more evident than after the attempt to murder has happened, because the police have everything on a plate for them. There are eyewitnesses, there's a dead dog as evidence, there's the paper trail of the letters that Thorpe sent to Norman, but instead of the police following the evidence, they close ranks around the establishment, and they don't just not believe Norman, they beat him up. Yeah, it's a real testament to Norman's resilience, isn't it? That despite going through one of the most traumatic things ever, continually coming up against these institutions which want to crush him, he's still determined to get the story out. 
Even given the context of the time, it is incredible that nothing has gone Norman's way. So surely Thorpe's about to get a bit of karma. Surely Norman is going to get at least one break his way. Let's find out. This is episode four, Opening the Closet. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account that lets you send, spend and receive money internationally. 170 countries, 50 currencies, one account. So Matt, can you tell me who WISE is made for? Well, Alice, it's made for jet setters and slow travellers, for online marketplaces and real life bazaars, for business in the city and pleasure on the coast. Wise is made for studying abroad and supporting your little brother's schooling back home. When you use Wise to manage your money across borders, you always get the mid market exchange rate with no markups and no hidden fees. Join 13 million customers and learn how the Wise account could work for you at wise.com slash UK scandal. The speed of transaction claims depends on individual circumstances and may not be available for all transactions. Wise.com slash UK scandal. March 1976, North Devon. In his study, Jeremy Thorpe slams the latest copy of Private Eye down on his antique desk. The last few months have been intolerable. Not only is Norman Scott still alive, but he's been mouthing off to rags like this. And for the first time, they're reporting what he's saying. Despite himself, Thorpe picks the magazine up again and rereads the story. It insinuates he was involved with the wretched boy and the shooting of his dog. Thorpe is confident he can't be linked to what happened on Exmoor. The gunman, Andrew Newton, is up in court on possession of a firearm next month, and he's been paid off to stick to his story, that Norman was blackmailing him. But Norman is due to testify at the trial. He'll no doubt claim Thorpe was behind the hit and air details of their affair too. The combination of Fleet Street reporting this and Private Eye's hints could finish him. What you need, darling, is a preemptive strike. Thorpe looks up to see Marion standing in the doorway. To say his wife has been a rock throughout this is an understatement. The only thing Thorpe fears more than losing his standing in the Liberal Party is losing her support. Meaning? If the party or the police can't help shut that silly boy down, you must fight fire with fire. Didn't you say the editor of the Sunday Times is an old friend? Thorpe smiles. He snatches up the phone and calls Harold Evans. Harry, old boy, how would you like an exclusive? Two days later... Marion places a copy of the Sunday Times on the breakfast table beside Thorpe's freshly boiled egg. He grins as he takes in the front page headline, The Lies of Norman Scott, followed by an exclusive interview Thorpe has given. I don't want to sound too naive, but it does make you wonder about all the headlines we've read in our lifetime, how many actually are the work of collusion in this way to paint innocent people in a particular light. And the headline, it's not just like, oh, there's two sides to this story. It's the lies of Norman Scott. You don't even need to read the rest of it. Just so you know, if we ever fall out, I would absolutely do this to you. (laughs) If I had any contacts on Fleet Street. You know too much. Alice Livine, more like. Oh my gosh, my fate was sealed over 30 years ago. He reads on with glee. The piece is a character assassination. A portrait of a deluded chancer who spent his life in and out of mental asylums. It directly addresses the rumours that have been swirling, refuting Norman's claims that they had any kind of relationship and that there was ever any correspondence between them. Later, he's delighted to answer the phone to Harold Evans. Harry, I must congratulate you on a wonderful scoop. The Sunday Times' reporting skills really are second to none. But Evans doesn't share Thorpe's exuberance. He sounds furious. For God's sake, Jeremy, Scott has issued a public statement discrediting everything you've said. He also says the police have letters you sent him during your affair. Is that true? Thorpe feels bile rise in his stomach. He thought those letters would be safely locked up with MI5 forever, as good as destroyed. Listen, Harry. Thorpe can hear him sigh heavily down the line. I'll take that as a yes. Scott is taking legal action to get the letters back. The Sunday Times is going to have to set the record straight. Thorpe thinks fast. If Norman gets those letters, the damage would be unthinkable. 
But if he can obtain them first, he'll be able to control the situation by offering extracts to Evans exclusively. Leave this with me, Harry. Let me make it right. The following afternoon, Thorpe goes through copies of the letters he's obtained via his solicitor. He's agreed with Evans that the Sunday Times can have two for publication, as long as they won't be presented in an unduly hostile way. Instead, they'll simply show that Thorpe was being kind to Norman, but nothing more. How much is he going to show? Just, dear Norman, (laughs) thanks very much, Jeremy. I was going to say, that redaction is going to be wild, isn't it? Is it going to be every other word? You know, like when you piece together clips of audio, is it going to be like, I was very happy to see Norman that day. (laughs) Make sure you contact me again. (laughs) It's basically just going to be some headed notepaper, isn't it, by the time he's finished? Thorpe chooses what he believes to be the most innocuous missives. One sympathising about Norman's dog being ill, and another encouraging him about a job he'd applied for in France. He's sure that once they've been published, everyone will lose interest in the story. He'll be able to put this nightmare behind him once and for all. One week later, April 1976, the Liberal Club, London. Thorpe nervously slips his hand into Marion's as they stride into the club's wood-panelled library together. As he expected, every single senior member of the party is waiting. Thorpe has no doubt that what happens here will make or break his position as leader of the Liberal Party. He's here because far from quelling the fire by preemptively sharing Norman's letters, he's only succeeded in fanning the flames. The Liberal Chief Whip, David Steele, reminds everyone of this as he gestures to the numerous copies of yesterday's Sunday Times strewn across the room. The front page headline reads, What I Wrote to Scott by Jeremy Thorpe. Jeremy, we've all had the chance to read yesterday's revelations in some detail. Thorpe's old adversary, Emlyn Hewson, delights in reading the line that made Thorpe the discussion of every breakfast table in Britain. <clears throat> Bunnies can and will go to France. Yours affectionately, Jeremy. There are a few sniggers. Hearing his old nickname for Norman out loud, Thorpe winces. Yes, Emlyn, I sometimes use terms that may be classed as more affectionate than other men. In this case, I was simply trying to revive the spirits of a man clearly in distress. That hardly constitutes evidence of a love affair. If I thought it did, why would I hand it willingly over to a national newspaper? Marion smiles approvingly. Thorpe feels stronger. If he can keep facing off their challenges with logic, he's sure he can get through this. When MP Clement Freud raises his hand to speak, he's even more heartened. At last, the cavalry's here. I feel rather awkward saying what I need to with Marion in the room. Perhaps it would be better if we talked without her present. Thorpe would prefer that too. He has no desire to put her through any more of this. But Marion furiously retorts. Whatever you have to say about my husband, you can say to my face. Freud hesitates, but only for a moment. Very well. I must ask, Jeremy... Is there any truth in the persistent rumours about your homosexuality? Thorpe feels like a rug has been pulled from under him. Freud is meant to be on his side. He glances at Marion. She looks appalled by the suggestion. Freud anxiously goes on. We can defend your right to be homosexual, Jeremy. It's legal now, after all. We can explain that your struggle to acknowledge this affair is what pushed an unstable man like Scott to go further and accuse you of attempted murder. Anything to get attention. The party can find a way to deal with that. Thorpe knows Freud is offering a lifeline. He feels Marion's hand tighten around his own. Thorpe takes in the hungry faces staring back at him. It's utterly humiliating. No other politician would be asked to discuss his sexual preferences in such a public forum. Despite Freud's best intentions, Thorpe knows any admission would end his political career and his marriage. It's clear to me that no matter how many times I defend myself, 
These doubts will continue to haunt the party. Thorpe takes a deep breath. Therefore, I will tender my letter of resignation with immediate effect. When he faces Marion, she's ashen-faced, clearly devastated. She remains silent as a car speeds them back to their London flat. I'm still an MP. I still have you and Rupert. That's all that matters. All I want is to put this whole sorry business behind us. Marion dutifully nods. Thorpe turns to look out of the window, trying to hide how devastated he feels. For the first time, Norman has got the better of him. He'll never make it to number 10. His glittering reign at the top is over. He's never hated Norman more. For now, he'll lay low, let the crisis pass. But he's not done. Not by a long way. He'll recover from this. And when he does, he'll destroy all those who have wronged him. Norman Scott included. A year later, April 1977, Lancashire. Andrew Newton strides through the gates of Preston Prison with one thing on his mind. Cash. He's just finished an 11-month term for possession of a deadly weapon. He's kept his mouth shut about Jeremy Thorpe. Now he's looking forward to getting what he deserves. The money he's owed. I mean, if I was going to do time for lying... I'd want money up front. Would you want that in your bank account the day you came out? Would you want it in your bank account while you're in prison? I'd definitely want some up front so I could stick it on my commissary credit. What's commissary? That's like the little prison tuck shop, you know, if you want some cigarettes or, I don't know, a single tampon. How do you know this? (laughs) Have I said too much? Imagine you in prison. (laughs) My God. I think either you wouldn't survive or you'd become the kingpin. Thank you, I think. Back in Blackpool a few hours later, at a corner table in his local pub, Newton sticks a pint in the hand of the contact who made all of the arrangements for the hit on Norman Scott. That's for you. What you got for me? The friend takes an envelope out of his pocket and pushes it towards him. Newton smiles as he picks it up, but counting the cash, he darkens. This ain't 10,000. It's five. What we owe you for the job? Newton feels his blood start to boil. Yeah, but I kept quiet. I was assured I'd be rewarded for that. The contact leans closer to Newton, hisses at him. You botched the job, chicken brain. Scott's still alive and he's tried to stir up all kinds of trouble for Thorpe. You're lucky to even get this. I would be livid. But the one job was to kill him. It's kind of wild that he's getting paid at all. It's amazing that just one discussion about what you'd be like in prison (laughs) and you're already such a (laughs) hard, cold bitch. Before Newton can retort, his friend is heading for the door. Newton looks from his disappearing frame to the money. He hurls his glass to the floor, furious. So what if he didn't finish the job? He's just spent 11 months inside for these fuckers. He's got a criminal record. He can't get another job just like that. If Thorpe won't pay him what he's due, he'll find another way. The following morning, Newton sits in the office of the London Evening News. After telling the editor his story about being a hired hitman, he pauses for dramatic effect, then makes his big announcement. And the man who instigated it all was Jeremy Thorpe. Newton sits back and places his hands behind his head, confident he's got the scoop of the century. I want 75 grand for the story and another 25 on top if I end up getting re-arrested and charged with a more serious offence. The editor roars with laughter. Newton's stunned. (laughs) The thing is, Mr Newton, my hands are tied. These rumours have been doing the rounds for months. We can't print a word without concrete evidence. This time, it's Newton who laughs. He pulls out his ace card, a tape recorder. 
He spent last night making calls to all his contacts involved in setting up the hit. The editor's mouth drops open as he listens to Thorpe's name repeated over and over again. Newton switches off the recorder, takes out the precious tape and grins. Now, let's negotiate. March 1978, Los Angeles. Sitting outside his beachside condo, Peter Bessel looks out at the ocean. He leans back into his recliner, enjoying the feeling of the warm sun on his face. Bessel's never been more sure that relocating here was the right decision. Feeling an afternoon nap is in order, he starts to close his eyes. But a gruff male voice with a British accent drags him back to consciousness. Peter Bessel, might we have a chat? Bessel snaps his eyes open to see two men standing in front of him, holding Metropolitan Police badges in front of his face. The warmth he feels is quickly replaced with a sudden chill when they give him their reason for flying out here. They want Bessel to confirm what they've finally pieced together, that as Thorpe's right-hand man for several years, he was part of an ongoing campaign to silence Norman Scott, and that one of the ways Thorpe discussed doing that was to murder him. Bessel bristles with discomfort, but he's used to covering Thorpe's tracks when it comes to Norman. He sits up straight and takes a deep breath. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Bessel may have cut ties with Thorpe, but he still can't bring himself to betray his old friend, nor does he have any desire to drop himself in it. He's confident that without him, no case can be built against Thorpe. All he has to do is stay silent. Can we go inside, Mr Bessel? Reluctantly, Bessel ushers them into the condo, closing the glass patio doors behind them. The senior detective takes out an old copy of the Sunday Times from two years ago, headlined The Lies of Norman Scott by Jeremy Thorpe. Have you read this, Mr Bessel? Bessel shakes his head. The detective picks it up, reads a passage. Bessel was always a shady character. To say we were friends is to wildly exaggerate. I had no part in his communications with Scott but I suppose he saw associating himself with me as a way of improving his own waning profile. He's thrown you to the wolves, Mr Bessel. Why are you protecting him? Bessel bristles. He doesn't like being reminded of Thorpe's betrayal or his own foolishness. Look, I have a nice life out here, a quiet life. To return to Britain and give evidence against a man with the weight of the establishment behind him would be insanity. So if you don't mind... Bessel indicates towards the door. The senior detective takes some papers from his suitcase, lays them on the desk. These were found behind a hidden door in your old office, Mr Bessel. Bessel feels the blood drain from his face as he focuses on what's in front of him. Receipts of payments made to Norman a copy of the letter Norman wrote to Thorpe's mother. Copies of letters between Bessel and Norman discussing payments. He'd stashed them away as an insurance policy, forgotten all about them. How do you forget about them? He's left them in another country. What kind of insurance policy is that? If they're an insurance policy, keep them with you. This is like when I went travelling when I was 18 and my mum bought me one of those flesh-coloured document and coin pouches that you were supposed to wear under your clothes so that you didn't get mugged. You know, all this just reinforces the view that you are actually a master criminal and that your mum is somehow involved in it. <laughs> oh no, have I incriminated her? There's enough here, Mr Bessel, for us to prosecute you as well as Mr Thorpe. Bessel feels light-headed. He clutches the wall to steady himself. He was diagnosed with emphysema a few months ago. He feels more breathless and weak by the day. A prison sentence would finish him off. He sits down, weighs up his options. If I made a statement about Thorpe, would I get immunity? The detective nods. Bessel feels sick at the thought of facing Thorpe in court. But he knows if the tables were turned, Thorpe wouldn't hesitate in throwing him under the bus. Bessel gives a defeated nod of agreement. The senior detective smiles. Believe me, Mr Bessel, with your evidence, 
Thorpe won't be able to wriggle out of this. We've got the bastard. In 1991, Bakersfield, California, two boys stumble upon a grisly discovery, the body of a young woman. In the Shadows, the new podcast from Wondery Plus follows the ensuing 32-year ordeal to uncover those responsible and bring them to justice. It was a mystery that riveted a desert town for years. Police immediately zeroed in on her longtime boyfriend, a beloved star athlete. Despite national attention and several trials, a conviction of the perpetrator remained elusive, and many thought it would never be solved. During the investigation of In the Shadows, several individuals revealed shocking information previously unknown to authorities. Ultimately, this new insight turned everything on its head and will bring you one step closer to deciding who's responsible for the murder. You can listen to In the Shadows at... Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, presidential lies, environmental disasters, corporate fraud. In our newest series, we look at the story of the Oklahoma City bombing, the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in United States history. On April 19, 1995, a moving truck packed with 4,800 pounds of explosives was detonated in downtown Oklahoma City. When the bomb went off, it killed 168 people and injured over 600 more. At first, both the American public and law enforcement believed international terrorists were behind the attack. But the evidence led investigators toward an unexpected and chilling conclusion. The Oklahoma City bombing appeared to be the work of domestic criminals in a plot bound together with political extremism, conspiracy theories, and a goal to strike back against the United States government. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. October 1978, Clerkenwell, London. Entering his chambers, George Carmen QC excitedly snatches up the morning paper on his desk. The headline screams that Jeremy Thorpe has been arrested and charged with conspiracy and incitement to murder. Carmen takes a bottle of whiskey from his filing cabinet, pours a large measure and knocks it back. Then he lights a cigarette and calls Thorpe's solicitor. This is George Carmen. Please can you let Mr Thorpe know I have a plan to keep him a free man. At the age of 50, Carmen is yet to break through to the big leagues. He became a QC eight years ago, but professional fame and fortune still eludes him. Good motivator for someone who's involved in justice. If anything, he's better known for his personal life of hard drinking and gambling. But he knows this is the case to prove his worth in the courts, not just the bars. Listen, George, I think you'd be an excellent choice, but Jeremy wants a big name. Someone with more criminal cases under their belt. Just get me a meeting. That's all I ask. Ushering Thorpe into his office later, Carmen knows he needs to play his cards carefully if he wants to represent him. They went to Oxford at the same time, moved in many of the same circles. The old boys' network should help, but he knows Thorpe is a shrewd operator. Carmen has to prove his worth. He's about to launch into his pitch, but he's thrown when Thorpe slams a legal handbook on his desk. I'm sure I don't need to remind you that I'm a qualified barrister myself, George. If I choose to go with you, I'll be deciding on strategy and giving guidance throughout. Anything less will be a deal-breaker, I'm afraid. I've watched enough Netflix documentaries to know that when people try and defend themselves or advise their legal team, It never works out. Also see our series on Stonehouse. Carmen struggles to keep his temper in check. Thorpe always was an arrogant git. He clearly expects Carmen to toady to him like everyone else. But Carmen's a man who's not afraid of a gamble. He once lost so much money at Blackjack, he had to sell his house. If he could survive that, he could bet big now. You got a third at Oxford, didn't you, Jeremy? Thorpe's face turns puce. He looks furious, but he nods. Carmen looms over him and crosses his arms. I got a first. I know what I'm doing. And I already have a strategy. But this won't work unless you trust me to get on with it. So either you do exactly as you're told, or you can piss off and go to prison. What's it going to be? 
Carmen sticks his hands in his pockets before Thorpe can see how much they're shaking. Taking in Thorpe's thunderous expression, he's certain he's blown it. But then, Thorpe breaks into a wide smile. All right, George, you've got the job. What do you need me to do? Carmen can't quite believe it. Now he has to live up to his promises and make this guilty man look innocent. Ah, the noble calling of the law. 3rd of May, 1979, Barnstable, North Devon. Thorpe grips Marion's hand as he stands on the stage of Queen's Hall. It's the night of the general election, and the result for Thorpe's constituency is about to be announced. If ever he needed a win, it's now. His trial is set to begin in five days, and Thorpe has had to fight just to run tonight. It hasn't been easy. With the Liberals refusing to fund him, Thorpe's mother has even had to sell the top floor of her house to raise the money for his campaign. It's a far cry from his glory days. He looks to his left, just beyond where the Conservative candidate stands. Next to him is the editor of Private Eye, who, as an extra dig at Thorpe, is also running in North Devon. So did the editor of Private Eye run as an independent? Actually, the editor of Private Eye is the candidate for the Dog Lovers Party, which is for anyone who was moved by the death of Rinka, the dog, uh, and in total gained 79 votes. A hush descends across the hall as the results are read out. Thorpe grips Marion's hand, looks hopefully at the announcer. But it's an annihilation. Thorpe's majority of 7,000 is completely overturned and the Tory candidate wins by 8,500 votes. Five years ago, he was within touching distance of number 10. Now he's not even an MP. Before he can begin to process it all, a huddle of reporters surround him. How do you feel, Mr Thorpe? Thorpe tries to muster up his usual bravado, but he can't do it. The gap was much wider than I thought. I, I don't know what else to say. An hour later, back at home, Thorpe silently watches the rest of the coverage on TV. When the phone rings, he lets Marion answer, keen to avoid any more questions from the press. She returns to the room with a sombre expression. That was your solicitor. The prosecution has applied for reporting restrictions at the trial to be lifted, and the judge has agreed. Thorpe feels the colour drain from his face. The press will be free to report everything that's said in court, including every detail about his relationship with Norman. Not only has he just lost a public vote as a politician, he'll now be subjected to a trial by the media. Thorpe is about to be the star attraction of the biggest circus in town, and he could be facing 15 years in prison at the end of it. He'll have to fight harder than ever, not only for what's left of his reputation, but for his freedom. The 11th of May, 1979, the Old Bailey, London. George Carmen QC looks up at the court's heaving press and public gallery. Then he glances at Jeremy Thorpe in the dock. He's propped up by several blue cushions to ease his back pain. It's day three of what the press have called the trial of the century, and his client, who's facing charges of conspiracy and incitement to murder, looks anxious. Carmen knows why. Success or failure in this case will be determined by his cross-examination of the man standing in the witness box, Peter Bessel. The trouble is, Bessel has proved harder to discredit than Carmen had hoped. Bessel's taken ownership of his past lies and shady dealings with Norman Scott and expressed regret. Due to ill health, he also looks pale and weak. Any attack on Bessel's unscrupulous behaviour and what Carmen terms as whopping lies he's told over the years, have led to the jury looking uncomfortable. Like he's badgering a dying man who's simply trying to make amends. Carmen decides he must stop, rethink. He turns to the judge, Sir Joseph Cantley, and suggests it may be a suitable time for the court to adjourn. To his amazement, 
Cantley's usual stern features soften. His lips turn into a smile. Oh, I think we've got time for one more whopper, if you like. Carmen can't believe it. The judge has effectively told the jury he thinks everything Bessel has said so far is a lie. It hits Carmen like a thunderbolt. Cantley, establishment through and through, is closing ranks to protect one of his own. And if he's setting the tone, it doesn't matter how harsh Carmen is. The jury will have to listen. This is why Britain is the ideal place to make this series, because the hypocrisy around our justice system is something that is just out there in the ether. We're like, our justice system is the envy of the world. And you've got a judge here, it's not that long ago, leading a jury purely because these guys went to similar schools, if not the same schools as him. Yes, and it speaks to the regard with which MPs were held at the time. They were these supposed pillars of society, and they kind of had carte blanche. They were beyond reproach. Taking his cue, Carmen regroups, goes in for the kill. Very well. Mr Bessel, is your real motive for telling this outrageous story money? Bessel hesitates. Carmen takes out a copy of a contract Bessel has signed. You have a deal with the Sunday Telegraph for your story, do you not? Bessel looks awkward, but slowly nods. In fact, this deal you've signed will pay £50,000 unless Mr Thorpe is acquitted. Then you only get half that amount. Isn't that right? Carmen watches as Bessel squirms in his seat. Uh, Yes. There are gasps from the public gallery. Bessel looks at his lap, ashamed. So you've entered into a contract by which you achieve double the money on the conviction of a former true and loyal friend. Bessel argues he's merely trying to make some cash, having earned little over the past four years. But Carmen knows the damage has been done. There are so many lies, Mr Bessel. Lies to Norman Scott, lies to Jeremy Thorpe, lies to your parliamentary colleagues, lies to just about everyone. I suggest you're a person who is incapable of being believed. All of Bessel's remaining poise seems to leave him. Watching him stagger from the stand, a broken man, Carmen swells with pride. He looks over at his client again. This time, Thorpe is smiling. Carmen can't relax yet, though. He still has Norman Scott to face off with. But he's not worried. With the judge on his side, destroying Norman should be a piece of cake. Twenty second of May, nineteen seventy nine, the Old Bailey, London. Norman's hand shakes as he places it on the Bible and swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. A bead of sweat runs down his face. He may look smart in a fitted brown suit, his hair combed neatly, but his hangover has left him feeling wretched. He's in no fit state to do this. And the thought of going to work with a hangover is bad enough. The thought of having to testify at the old Bailey. The clammy factor would be through the roof. And this is back in the 70s. There was no Barocca back then. (laughs) Norman glances at Thorpe. The man still terrifies him. Then George Carmen rises to his feet to cross-examine. Norman takes a breath, composes himself. Hello, Mr Scott. I'd first like to ask if you're receiving any medical treatment. Norman immediately bristles but guesses his game. The police have tried this tack for years, to discredit him before he's even begun to tell his side of the story. Norman had expected it, and he answers calmly. But a series of further questions shake him. Carmen paints him as an unreliable and untrustworthy witness, and then he goes for the jugular. When you went to the police in 1962... You said there was no anal penetration the night you stayed at Mrs Thorpe's. Yet now, you say there was. Yes, because in 1962, homosexuality was illegal. I didn't want to incriminate either of us. Norman hears himself explain how he didn't consent to the sex. How when Thorpe penetrated him, he felt like he was being cut in half. (laughs) 
a ripple of laughter surges through the courtroom. It soon becomes louder, some spectators rocking in their chairs. Norman is horrified. He's describing how Thorpe raped him, and the court is openly laughing. Very easy when we look back on these stories to see them just about power regarding the establishment, but this is also about widespread societal views at the time, and Britain at this time was widely homophobic, and the behaviour of the public just shows how brave Norman was, not just to take on the establishment, but even to talk about these things in front of his fellow citizens. Norman looks at Thorpe again, resting his gaze on him this time. He catches a flash of something in his eyes. Norman wonders what he's thinking about. A memory suddenly hits him. They were walking along a London street when Thorpe pulled him into some trees and fondled him. Thorpe always wanted the excitement, the thrill. Before Norman knows what he's doing, he's saying it out loud. Jeremy Thorpe lives on a knife edge of danger. Gasps echo through the court. Carmen looks momentarily shocked. What about you? Do you like living on the edge? No, but I have certainly lived in danger for much of my life because of your client. Norman points directly at Thorpe. Tears spring to his eyes. Norman tries to wipe them away as the cruel questions keep coming. There are more mocking laughs. The judge only seems to encourage this cruelty. He accuses Norman of getting excited, constantly tells him to speak up, to get a grip. Norman starts to realise that despite Thorpe being in the dock, he's the one who is really on trial. Before he can catch his breath, Carmen moves on to the letters Norman kept. You were being vindictive. You were trying to destroy Mr Thorpe, a statesman and a pillar of our establishment. No, I was afraid that without the letters, I would have no proof about my homosexual relationship with Jeremy. I was not being vindictive. I was trying to sort out my national insurance. National insurance is my lifeblood. Again, there's a ripple through the court. Norman realises the jury are hanging on his every word. He's exhausted, but he forces himself to go on. I didn't think this court would ever sit, I can assure you. I thought the establishment would cover it up. All I've ever wanted is to be heard. Norman fixes his eyes on Carmen. He's not afraid of him anymore. Carmen seems to know it, dismissing him at last. Leaving the witness box, Norman holds his head high. He's taken a beating, been degraded, laughed at, but he's survived. More importantly, his words will be reported. A jury will discuss them. Finally, he has a fighting chance at justice. Fourteenth of June, 1979, the Old Bailey. In the dock, Thorpe readjusts the cushions behind his back. He can't get comfortable. He's waiting for George Carmen to make his closing speech and for this degrading ordeal to finally be over. Thorpe is still furious at his barrister for refusing to let him take the stand. He's convinced staying silent will strike the doubters as an admission of guilt. But Carmen insisted that Thorpe giving evidence was too dangerous. Listening to his barrister's closing argument now, Thorpe's anger quickly dissipates. Carmen is as compelling as ever. He finishes up with a theatrical flourish. Mr Thorpe has spent 20 years in British politics and obtained thousands and thousands of votes in his favour. Now, the most precious 12 votes come from you. It's a wonderful speech, but is it enough? Thorpe is ruminating on this when the judge starts to give his closing remarks. Mr Thorpe is a privy councillor, a former leader of the Liberal Party and a national figure with a very distinguished public record. Thorpe swells with pride. He eyes Marion and his mother in the public gallery. They look equally pleased especially when Cantley goes on to demolish Peter Bessel, labelling him a humbug. He then calls Newton a chump. 
but he reserves his most damaging vitriol for Norman Scott. You will remember him well. A hysterical, warped personality. Accomplished sponger and very skillful at exploiting sympathy. A spineless, neurotic character. Addicted to self-advertisement. He's a crook. He's a fraud. He is a whiner. He is a parasite. Cantley finishes by telling the jury the evidence against Thorpe is almost entirely circumstantial. Thorpe can hardly believe what just happened. He glances at Carmen, who looks equally stunned. It's as if the judge is on the defence team. An hour later, Thorpe is in good spirits when he arrives back at Brixton Prison to await the verdict. As always, he complains of a stomachache and is promptly taken to the hospital wing, far more agreeable than the cells. He's delighted to be told that tonight's supper of smoked salmon and rare roast beef has been sent over by Clement Freud. Alongside it, he's given a glass of Shabley and the evening paper. Looking at the front page, Thorpe's jubilant mood fades. To his horror, the coverage still leans towards his guilt, just as it did before the trial started. The reality of Thorpe's situation hits him. The judge may be on his side, but the jury are ordinary people. What if, like the voters in North Devon a month ago, they no longer believe in him? They could already have been poisoned by every news report they read in the months preceding the trial. Thorpe's appetite disappears. He could be spending far longer here than he ever imagined. He could be finished. And there's nothing he can do but wait. Friday the 22nd of June, 1979. The Buller's Arms, Dartmoor. Norman feels oddly detached as he stares at the TV in the corner of the bar. He came here to wait for the verdict in the hope that beer and the company of friends would prove a welcome distraction. Norman's been assured he did well on the stand. Several newspapers have swung his way in their coverage over the past few days. But he doubts it will make any difference. The lacerating summing up by the judge felt like a personal attack. Norman takes a swig of his beer as the landlord turns up the television. The verdict is in. Despite everything, Norman can't help but allow himself a moment of optimism as he hears the jury was unanimous. He squeezes his eyes shut, hoping against hope to hear the word guilty. Thorpe has been found. Not guilty. Norman sinks into his seat. Once again, Thorpe has won. Norman's friends rally round, offering words of comfort. But he's still focused on the rest of the news report. He hears how when the verdict came, Thorpe threw his cushions into the public gallery with joy. He then thanked the police officers in the dock before kissing the female usher. Norman watches the footage of Thorpe beaming outside the Old Bailey, his arms outstretched to his waiting public like the Messiah. One of Norman's friends shouts over to the barman to turn the TV off. He obliges, but it's too late. Norman knows these images will be burnt onto his brain forever. Through the window of the pub, he can see a bunch of reporters waiting. He dutifully goes outside to give them what they want. A statement. I hoped and prayed Jeremy Thorpe would go to prison because he had done such appalling damage. But somehow... I knew this would happen. Norman has experienced every emotion possible towards Thorpe over the past 19 years. If he holds on to it all, to this terrible injustice, he'll drown in it. There's nothing left to do but accept what's happened. He said his piece, and that's all he'd ever asked for. Norman looks up at the fading sun, then heads back into the pub to join the few loyal friends who still love and believe him. He hopes that with their help, he can finally move on and be free. P. 
Peter Bessel never received any money from the Sunday Telegraph. He later wrote a book about the Norman Scott affair called Cover Up, but no commercial publisher would touch it. He died of emphysema in 1985, aged 64, with a garage full of self-published, unsold copies. Despite his acquittal, the Norman Scott case finished Jeremy Thorpe's career and public life. In the mid-1980s, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. His last ambition, to be given a peerage, was never achieved after he was turned down by one Liberal Party leader after another. He was nursed by Marion until her death in 2014. Thorpe died the same year, aged 85. At 82, Norman Scott is fit and well. He lives in Devon with his partner of 26 years and still rides every day. In 2019, actor Ben Whishaw won a Golden Globe for his portrayal of Norman in the TV drama series A Very English Scandal and dedicated the award to him, calling him a true queer hero and icon. Norman has since said the positive reaction to his character's ordeal in the drama changed his life. At last, he is believed. So, Alice, before we go, there's something we need to tell our listeners. Our colleagues at Wondery don't only make this show. Well, no, but for clarity, this is their favourite and most important show. Obviously, but they make other shows too. And one of them, I think, is a perfect fit for British scandal listeners. Mm, Is it British? Yep. Is it scandalous? Definitely. And it's also blooming brilliant. It's Stolen Hearts. Can you tell me what happens, but without any spoilers? Okay, I'll try. Uh, Jill Evans is a decorated police officer in Wales. She's a big success, except when it comes to romance. And after multiple failed engagements, she's starting to think it's never going to happen for her. Until, that is, she meets Dean Jenkins online. He's an entrepreneur, oozes confidence, and he's a bit of a hunk. Get in there, Jill. Well, she does well in. Just six months later, she's pregnant... And she and Dean make plans to spend the rest of their lives together. Oh, sweet. And that's the end of the story. If you want to listen to that, you can on Wondery. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's not really the end of the story. Because just after Halloween, Jill receives a shocking message that will change everything and which threatens to take away her dreams of happiness, her career, and maybe even her freedom. Basically think Bridget Jones starring in Line of Duty, directed by Guy Ritchie. That's not a thing. Can I hear a bit? Of course. Jill trusts Dean with her life. He becomes a part of the family and he fits like a glove. He joins Jill's family on holiday in France and Dean finds time to do quick business with Jill's brother who sells him a new car. Of course, it's a jag. I mean, Dean already has one in silver, but this one's in blue, so frankly, it's a must-have. Anyway, it's nothing the governor can't afford. He'd look in my wardrobe and he'd say, I'm going to buy you some clothes. He'd be like, I need to buy you a new wardrobe. To prepare for the baby on the way, Dean helps Jill pick out a new car, a slick black Chrysler, with a DVD player in the back seats for her two girls. And just in case anybody wasn't aware that they were totally in love, Dean suggests they get matching GUV licence plates, a nod to his governor range. And Dean says that with the new baby just around the corner, he's going to take the next big step. He's going to move to Wales to be with Jill. It's not going to be easy, moving his business with his two girls in London, but he's determined to make it work. For now, though, Jill and Dean are still long distance, meeting up on weekends. One Sunday afternoon with Jill in the passenger seat, Dean drives her home and in true Dean form, he's driving over the speed limit. I said, you better watch your speed in you get stopped. And he said something about, oh, I can't afford to get stopped. I'll be back in prison or something like that. And I went, what? He was laughing. He said, you're so gullible, you believe anything. And of course I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. Gullible? I'm not so sure about that. Okay, so that was Stolen Hearts and I am in. When is it out, please? It's out now, Alice. Now. You can get Stolen Hearts on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts and you can binge the whole thing ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. 
This is the fourth episode in our series, The Murderous MP. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read A Very English Scandal by John Preston, An Accidental Icon by Norman Scott, Rinkgate, The Rise and Fall of Jeremy Thorpe by Barry Penrose, and In My Own Time by Jeremy Thorpe. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Wendy Granditer wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leludis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondering.